Hi, in this video, we are going to start the topic chemical reactions and energy. So this topic is all about the energy change in reaction. We are interested in looking at whether the reaction will release energy or does it absorb energy. Uh, how much energy is released, it, how much energy is absorbed, it, and how can we experimentally determine the energy released it or absorbed it by the chemical process. So let's get started. Now in the first part here, we are trying to introduce some basic concept in energetics. Uh, what do you mean by energetics? Actually, energetics is referred as the study of energy change in chemical reactions. So uh, in the past, uh, in the A level, this topic belongs to energetics, but now it just has another name. Um, down here, we have a basic principle or concepts that you must know before we move ahead, which is the conservation of energy. Um, in Form 1, we did talk about that. Um, basically, in Chinese, we say that the energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, So, you cannot create energy, you cannot destroy energy. The only thing you can do is to change the form of energy, or we say energy conversions. So energy can be converted into different forms, uh, but it cannot be created nor destroyed. In chemistry, we need to know actually some energy conversions in typical process, such as like combustion of petrol or in a chemical cell. Uh, in DSC, it did ask once, okay, but this question should be easy and manageable, so I will not spend too much time on it. Now down here, we start to come across a new term, which is called enthalpy change. Uh, enthalpy change, at this moment, you can take it as energy change. You can just take enthalpy as energy. But there is a slight difference between enthalpy and energy. Okay, We will talk about it uh, later. Now here, we have some terminologies that we need to sort out. First of all, system and surrounding. Uh, we can look at this example first. This is when we are burning the town gas using a Bunsen burner. Now, you know that when we burn a town gas, it is basically the reaction between town gas and oxygen, and the process will produce carbon dioxide and water vapor and at the same time, it releases a lot of heat energy to the surrounding. Now, here we say that the chemical species is the system, or the chemical system. Or, to be more precise, the system refers to the chemical energy stored in these reactant molecules. Now, for the surrounding, it is referring to the surrounding air. Okay, and during this process, we say that the chemical energy stored in the chemicals is converted into heat energy and it is transferred from the system to the surrounding. Okay, so this is the meaning about the system and the surrounding. Usually, system refers to the chemical energy stored in the reactant molecules and the surrounding, usually talking about the air. Or if this reaction takes place in an aqueous solution, then the surrounding would be the water, the solvent. Okay? That's the idea. Now here, something important. Heat. Now, what is the meaning of heat? We will say that uh, in chemistry, very often, when there is a chemical reaction, chemical process, when there is an energy change, then the energy is changed in a form of heat. And heat, as a form of energy, is transferred between the system and surrounding. Now, of course, uh, some process, some reaction does not only involve heat, such as just now burning does not only uh, involve heat energy, but it also involves light energy, right? But very often, or at least in this topic, we will focus on the heat energy most of the time. Now, down here, internal energy. Now, internal energy basically means the total kinetic energy of a reactant molecules and the total potential energy of a molecule. Now, for kinetic energy, you know it has to do with the movement of substance, movement of 
thing. Now here for a molecule or for, for a chemical compound, the so-called movement not only involving the translational movement, moving from one place to another, but it is also concerning about the vibration, right? All the bonds are vibrating all the time. Also the rotation. Now you see movement, vibration, rotation, all of these are involving movement and therefore they also contribute to the total kinetic energy. Now for potential energy, basically it refers to the chemical energy stored in a chemical bond. Okay, uh, for details I will not explain too much. So this is the idea about internal energy. But even though we know what we are looking for, it is very very difficult or almost impossible to directly determine the total internal energy of a molecule because it's too complicated. Therefore, uh, we do not interested in the total or absolute internal energy of a molecule. Rather, we are interested in the change in internal energy. We are interested in how the internal energy is changed because as the internal energy changed, they are changed in a form of heat. And if you know the change, then we are able to know how much heat can this process release or how much heat will this process absorb. And that would again be useful when it comes to application. So here we are interested in the change in internal energy. All right. Um, I understand you may get a little bit confused. Let me give you an analogy. Um, think about you as a retail shopkeeper. Okay, you are selling goods to your customer. So all you are interested in is how much the client, your customer, can pay. Right? If they can pay a huge money, well, it's perfectly fine. If you can only pay a little, then perhaps it is not a very good customer. Right? Do you have to really concern about how much money that person has? You don't have to, right? So no matter he is a rich guy or poor guy, as long as he can pay up, as long as he can transfer money from his pocket to your pocket, that would be fine. So you're not interested in finding the actual quantity of energy. Rather, we are interested in the change in energy. For that, it is the most important thing. Okay. So that's the idea. Now over here, we have three more energy terms. Heat change, change in internal energy, and the enthalpy change. Now you know what is change in internal energy. So just now, uh, basically, uh, when the energy is changed, that is called change in internal energy of, uh, of a chemical species. Heat change. So like I said, heat is the form of energy that is often associated when there is an internal energy change. So when the internal energy of a molecule changes, usually internal energy is converted into heat energy, just like that. But what about enthalpy change? Now, these two terms, what is the difference between this and this? Now here, let's look at the definition. Let's just look at the definition first. Now you see, change in internal energy is defined as the heat change at constant volume, constant volume. That means the reaction takes place in a rigid container, in a container that cannot have its volume changed. For example, uh, a glass bottle, for example, a stopper the conical flask, a stopper the test tube. So these are all uh, containers that has a constant volume. Okay? Um, what about Enthalpy change. Enthalpy change is also a heat change, but this time it is under a constant pressure. So what do you mean by constant pressure? Uh, you can think about it as a container with flexible uh, uh, container wall. Uh, for example, a balloon, a balloon. So if the reaction takes place in a balloon, for instance, the reaction gives out a lot of heat. So when the gas inside the balloon get heat up, then the balloon will expand, right? Now, when the balloon expands, you understand that it will expand to the point where the pressure inside the balloon is the same as the outside. Then it will stop expanding, 
right? So if the reaction take place in a balloon, then we will say that the condition is constant pressure because uh, the pressure is really the same, right? It is always uh, the same as the atmospheric pressure. They maintain the constant pressure by undergoing expansion or contraction, right? But of course, if you do the experiment in a, in a stopper, the glass uh, test tube, you cannot have the pressure maintained constant, right? So that one is constant volume and this one is constant pressure. So you see, actually the difference between enthalpy change and internal energy change is whether the reaction take place in a constant pressure condition or a constant volume condition, okay? And in chemistry, in this topic, we are focused on enthalpy change. So bear in mind this one, I have both the entire sentence. The enthalpy change is the, of a reaction is the heat change at constant pressure, constant pressure, okay? You may ask why. Um, probably because most of the reactions are taking place under the atmosphere. So uh, that's why enthalpy change is more practically relevant, okay? Now down here, this is something extra, so I'll just quickly talk about it. Even though you don't understand, it is perfectly fine. Now we have a reaction, and this reaction produces hydrogen gas. Now if the reaction takes place in a stop product, uh, flask, a stoppered volumetric flask, then uh, as the reaction proceeds, uh, of course the reaction itself is, uh, is releasing heat, so the total, so the content will be heated up. So you see it is changing from 25 at the beginning until 29, okay? Now as the reaction takes place, it produces hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas will be trapped inside the flask, and it will increase the pressure inside the flask. But because of the flask is a rigid container, it cannot expand. So actually the volume is constant, but the pressure inside increases. Okay? Now if the if the reaction takes place in this condition, then the heat change will be the same as internal energy change. Why? Because constant volume. Okay? Because constant volume. Okay? Now, what about in this situation? Now, same reaction take place, but this time we do not have the stopper. So if you do not have the stopper, then the gas inside is able to expand, right? Now, but as it expands, it does not expand with no cost. They expand with a cost because as the gas expands, actually it has to overcome the atmospheric pressure. Because we're always exposed to the atmospheric pressure. We are all get pressed by the atmospheric pressure all the time including the gas, right? So here, we use uh, something called imaginary weightless piston to represent the atmospheric pressure, to represent the atmospheric pressure. So as the reaction takes place, as the gas is produced, uh, it will actually push the piston up, okay, during the expansion. And pushing the piston up is requiring energy, requires energy, and the energy is called work done against atmospheric pressure, right? Because you're pushing it from this position to this position, right? So, you know, work done equals to force times displacement, okay? So, that's the idea. Now, so, if you look at the equation here, you see, uh, in this case, the total change in internal energy is not only equal to the heat change, but it part of it also contribute to the work done against the pressure, P delta V, okay? Uh, P delta V is used to represent the work done because, uh, you know, uh, work done equals to F times delta S, right? Okay, uh, force times the change in displacement, right? Uh, in this case, the piston here, uh, you can think about it as, uh, this is a cylinder, right, the cylinder, and uh, cylinder is basically area times the, the height, the height I will put S, okay, so, you know, volume equals to A times S, right, the area multiplied by um, uh, the height, okay, and as it expands, then the cylinder becomes taller, 
right? The cylinder becomes taller. So now this is the area, this is the, the, the S prime, okay, because it is taller. So you see um, the delta V is actually equals to A and then V prime minus V, oh, sorry, S prime minus S, right? Because the change in volume is basically the change in height of the two cylinder. So that's why delta V equals to A times delta S, which is basically here. Now, uh, here we need to have one more thing because you know that um, for, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, okay, because you know for pressure, pressure equals to force over area, right? Okay, so if you rearrange, then F equals to P times A, right? If you substitute this into this equation, then here equals to P times A delta X, right? And you see this one is this one is this one, right? So that's why it is P delta V, okay? So that's why work done can be expressed in terms of pressure times the change in volume, okay? So here, change in internal energy equals to not only the heat change, but also the work done against the pressure. So, but this one only exists in this scenario where the flask is open. Because here, when the flask is open, it is always exposed to 1 atm. The pressure is always constant. Now, when the pressure is constant, then it fulfills the criteria of enthalpy change, heat change measure at constant pressure. So that's why, going down in here, when we have a constant pressure, delta V is not zero, which is able to expand. Then you see, delta U equals to Q plus P delta V. And like I said, when the heat change takes place at constant pressure, it is referred to as delta H. So actually here, delta U equals to delta H plus P delta V. So the difference between delta U and delta H, okay, the change in internal energy and enthalpy change, not uh, in terms of the definition, that would be either the reaction take place in a constant volume or constant pressure, but in mathematic expression, the difference is the P delta V, okay, P delta, P, P delta V, the work done, whether the work done against the atmospheric pressure is considered. Okay, so in other words, delta U is larger than delta H. Okay, if you look at that, if you look at the left hand side here, if this is a constant volume, delta V is zero, so delta U equals to Q. Okay, so basically all the all the internal energy has been converted into heat. One hundred percent of the change in internal energy is converted into heat. Okay, now um, in you may ask, in chemistry, why are we concerned more about enthalpy change? Uh, we often use delta H. Um, the reason is probably due to uh, most of the reaction take place in the open air. So uh, that's why it is the condition where the pressure is constant. Uh, plus, uh, very often when reaction take place, uh, that would be work done against the atmosphere. So delta H is more relevant, okay? Now, next page here, exothermic and endothermic process. So actually we did talk about it in form three chemistry. So um, actually when it comes to energy change or the heat change, um, there's only two possible outcomes. One is when the system transfer heat to the surrounding or the system absorb heat from the surrounding. Okay, it's just like, uh, you only you either paying money to the others or you get paid right by the others. So there's no other option. And here it obviously depends on the change, the process, right? Like if you're buying something, you're paying. If you're working for somebody, you get paid, right? So it all depends on what you're doing. Similarly for chemical process or reactions. Now here, water is going to be vaporized into water vapor. Now, knowing that water is having a lower energy than the water vapor, then as you are changing from low energy water to high energy vapor, 
you must need extra energy. But you cannot create your energy your own. You must get energy from somewhere else. So that's why it must absorb heat energy from the surrounding to the chemical system. Okay. Now, if this is the situation, if heat is absorbed from the surrounding to the chemical system, we call it endothermic process. Endothermic process. Uh, if we do it another way round, if the water vapor condenses back to water, then you are changing high energy vapor into low energy water. You must get rid of some energy. Now, if you get rid of some energy, of course, you cannot destroy it. So that's why you must transfer it to somewhere else. And of course, you are going to transfer it into the surrounding. And that's why during this process from vapor to water, you are losing heat. And this process is called exothermic process, exothermic process. Okay. Now down here, we have some examples of endothermic processes and exothermic processes. Um, to be honest, most of the chemical reactions that you have learned is exothermic process. Um, there is a reason why. We will talk about it just, just uh, a couple of minutes later. Uh, here, endothermic process. Now, first of all, make sure you can sort out this change of physical state. Like melting, boiling, evaporation, sublimation, all these are changing from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. For example, you see melting is basically solid to liquid, right? Solid should have less energy than liquid. So that's why whenever you are changing from a low energy state to a high energy state, it must be endothermic. It must absorb extra heat from the surrounding. Okay. Similarly, if you are changing from a high energy state to low energy state, such as uh, condensation, which is from high energy vapor to low energy liquid, you must release some energy in order to do so. Okay. Uh, dissolving some salt in water could be endothermic, like sodium chloride when it dissolves in water, actually it is endothermic. So theoretically the water should get cold as you add salt into it. Decomposition of uh, calcium carbonate, uh, cracking, right? These are examples. Exothermic process like combustion, all the combustion process are exothermic, all the neutralization process are exothermic. Uh, precipitation reaction as well uh, are exothermic, uh, something like that. Now down here, enthalpy level diagram. So this one is use, using a diagram to show you the change in enthalpy of substance. And actually, we did talk about that before. Now, uh, here, delta H basically is the difference between the enthalpy of product and the enthalpy of reactant. Um, this one only trying to show you um, how the energy will change. Uh, this one is only qualitative discussion rather than quantitative because, uh, again, we cannot really find out the enthalpy, the exact enthalpy of a substance. So here we are only doing a qualitative discussion. Now on the right hand side here, um, you see, if you have an exothermic process, you release energy, you release energy. So you must start off with a lot of energy and ends up with very few energy, right? So here you see the enthalpy of product is smaller than the enthalpy of reactant. So the reactant has more energy. So as it changes from high energy to low energy, it get rid of the energy to the surrounding and therefore this is exothermic process. So for exothermic process, the delta H is negative, negative, okay? So bear in mind. And one more thing, when we have an exothermic reaction, as the heat is released to the surrounding, so the surrounding gets more energy, so the surrounding gets hotter. That makes a lot of sense. So that's why the surrounding gets hotter, okay? An example would be combustion or neutralization. When you burn something, the surrounding must be hotter, right? Otherwise, you can't burn the fuel to cook things because basically you try to burn the fuel to, to get the heat that can be used to either cooking your food or keep yourself warm, okay? Heating your shower, water, something like that, okay? Uh, for endothermic reaction, so it's another way round because now we are trying to absorb heat from the surrounding. So you are changing from low energy reactant to high energy product. So you see here, low energy reactants become high energy product. So the energy increased it. So delta H is positive. 
Now for uh, positive, uh, wrong spelling, positive. Okay. Um, so here, because you are taking the energy away from the surrounding, so the surrounding gets fewer energy and therefore the surrounding gets cooler. Okay. Now, a good example would be ice water. You know, if you order ice water, okay, uh, the ice will melt. When the ice melts, it is changing from low energy solid to high energy liquid. Right, so during this process, it must absorb heat from the surrounding. Now, in the case of ice water, the surrounding would probably be the water surrounding the ice. Right, so when the ice melts, it absorbs heat energy from the water, and therefore making the water cold. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so here we have a practice question. We have two practice questions. So. Uh, my advice is you pause the video and try to do it and then you will resume the video and check the answers okay now let's have a look burning of sugar no matter you burn anything no matter what thing you burn whenever I see the word burning it must be exothermic okay conversion of frost to water vapor so frost is solid water vapor is a gas Low energy to high energy, it must absorb energy, so it must be endothermic. Okay, removing an electron from an oxygen atom, so you take away the electron. The electron originally get attracted by the nucleus very strongly. You need to forcefully pull away the outer outer electron. It has to require energy, so it must be endothermic. Okay, now dissolving strong acid in water. Based on the common sense, you know, adding acid into water is highly exothermic. That's why when we uh, when we try to di uh, dilute a strong acid, dilute a concentrated acid, we will add small amount of acid into large amount of water, right? Now here, this one, uh, this is actually cracking. Okay, if you cannot recognize, please put it down. This is actually cracking. So cracking is a very important example that is endothermic. Okay. Uh, F here, so water becomes H2 and O2. This process is actually the electrolysis of water. Electrolysis of water. So this process is endothermic because we need to apply electricity. Okay. Now here, uh, this is ethanol acid. This is uh, calcium hydroxide, and this is actually a neutralization reaction. When we have a neutralization reaction, it must be exothermic, just like that. Now down here, sketch an enthalpy level diagram for the following reaction. So here, the y-axis is the enthalpy. So this one, you see the delta H is negative, right? That means it is exothermic. So exothermic, that means the enthalpy of reactant is higher than the enthalpy of product. So here we have Mg solid. 2HClAq. By the way, uh, starting from this topic, and actually only for this topic, you must include the physical state of all the chemical species, simply because different physical states could have different energy. Just now we say that water, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, could have different energy. So that's why, starting from here, you need to always include physical state in chemical symbol, chemical formula, chemical equation, okay? Only for this topic. So this is the product, now it becomes the, sorry, this is the reactant, now it becomes the product. So MgCl2, 2H2 gas, right? And this is an exothermic reaction, the delta H is negative, you can copy this one, 433.8 kilojoule per mole, okay? Just like that. Okay, so lastly, for this page, we want to learn more about the enthalpy change in terms of the bond breaking and bond forming. Now, first of all, you can choose to memorize it. Okay, um, here, to break a bond, to break a chemical bond, you will need energy. Now this one is okay, it sounds fair enough, right? If you want to break something, you need energy. Uh, that is quite intuitive. But here, if you form a bond, it releases energy. Huh, 
This one may be a little bit abstract, a little bit hard to understand. Um, breaking a bond requires energy is totally fine, but forming a bond releasing energy, hmm, why is that? Uh, we will talk about it uh, towards the end, don't worry. But right now, just kind of memorize it. Okay, break bond, uh, absorb energy, form bond, release energy. Okay, now here, using bond breaking and bond forming, uh, we are able to use these to evaluate the energy change of a reaction. For example, here, this is a very simple reaction where hydrogen gas release with, uh, reacts with chlorine gas to form two hydrogen chloride gas. Now, during this process, you can look into it as to break the HH bond, break the CLCL bond, and forming two HCl bond, right? And if we are able to find out all the energy involved in breaking uh, one mole of HH bond, one mole of CLCL bond, and uh, energy involved, energy released when we form two moles of HCl bond, then we can simply summarize all of these enthalpy terms, plug into this equation, and find out the enthalpy change of this reaction. Okay, so this is the idea about um, how uh, bond breaking and bond forming is related to energetics. Um, here, you notice that um, we require less energy to break the bond than the energy released when you form the bond. If this is the case, then obviously this is an exothermic reaction because heat release is larger than heat required. You can put it down because the heat released it is larger than the heat absorbed it. Then of course, it is exothermic. Okay? So that's the idea. Uh, if you look at here, now just now you see H2 reacts with Cl2 to form HCl, and the delta H is negative 184. Okay? Now what about we do it another way around? Now if you do it another, another way around, changing HCl into H2 and Cl2, basically we flip this two, right? So this time we are breaking two HCl bond and forming one more of HH bond and one more of CLCL bond, then obviously the number would be the same, but the sign will be reversed. Okay, now this one is important because later on, when we are dealing with thermonuclear equation, we may be a we may need to flip the equation. Remember, equations can be flipped, but as you flipped the equation, the enthalpy terms also flipped. Okay, because the bond breaking and bond forming are reversed. So that's the idea. Uh, lastly, I, I try to talk about here. Bond forming, why is it exothermic? So just now, bond breaking is endothermic, it's understandable, but bond forming, why is it exothermic? Actually, if you look at this diagram, when we form a bond, we will assume two separate bonding atoms are coming from far apart, far away, okay? Now, when atoms are far away from each other and they are exposed to no attractive force and we would define their potential energy as zero. They don't have potential energy because they are so far away, okay? Now, as they want to form a bond, then the two atoms will come together, getting closer and closer. In this case, the potential energy actually decreases, decreases. The reason is because potential energy has to do with the relative position, right? If they are in infinity distance, then they, they, they have the highest potential energy. As they get closer, they will have fewer and fewer potential energy. Now, as they come to very close distance, where they reach the bonding distance where they overlap the electron shell and forming the covalent bond. And at this point, it is when the potential energy is the lowest, okay? Because they are now close to each other, unable to separately move around, right? It's like two becomes one. So the potential energy is 
the minimum at this point. So you see it is changing from high energy to low energy. So energy is released during this process. But bear in mind, even though this one is defined as the highest energy, it is zero. Okay, this is only by definition. So think about it as in this situation it is zero, but in this situation maybe it is negative 100. So changing from zero to negative 100, you release energy. So that's why bond forming is exothermic. Okay? So that's the idea. Now we have uh, some practice question to clear the concept. Um, again, you can pause the video and try to work on this and then we will resume the video and check. Now here, one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to form two moles of ammonia. And this series of diagrams show you the bond breaking and the bond forming. Now using a balanced chemical equation with physical state, uh, the reaction above. Um, so N2 reacts with three moles of hydrogen gas to form two moles of ammonia gas. Okay. Now this one, actually this reaction is reversible, but uh, from this one, this, uh, this question, we have no idea whether it is reversible or not. So this case, it is okay to use single-headed arrow. Um, here, state precisely what bonds are broken and what bonds are formed. So here, actually, we break the nitrogen triple bond and also we break the hydrogen bond, three moles of HH bond. And as we form our product, it forms actually six NH bond. So we can put it down, okay? One of these and three of this, okay? And for this one, it forms six NH bond. Okay? Now, here, it says that the total energy required to break the bond is this one, and the energy released when the bonds are formed is this one. So, calculate the enthalpy change, assuming the reaction uh, proceeds to completion. So, here, the enthalpy change, so delta H equals to bond breaking minus bond forming. So 2253 minus 2346, which is equal to 93 okay, negative 93 kilojoule. Okay? Now, uh, this one you can also include per mole because uh, if you look at here, one mole of nitrogen reacts with three mole of hydrogen. So they are all per mole. Okay? Now, sketch an enthalpy level diagram for the reaction above. Now, because it is exothermic, so you will expect to have the reactants being more energetic than the products. So here, no need to put down this one. Enthalpy, okay, then we start off with N2, 3H2, now it becomes 2NH3, guess, and here delta H equals to negative 3 kilojoule per mole, okay, just like that. Okay, so down here we have uh, the hydrolysis of bromomethane uh, by water. So here, state precisely what bonds are broken, what bonds are formed. Now, uh, questions like this, um, sometimes you may need to draw out every single bond of the chemicals. So here, water, instead of showing in this way, how about we show it in this way? And that would be more obvious when it comes to the bond breaking and bond forming. Similarly, for this one, it would be best if you put it this way. Right? And this one obviously HBr. Okay? Now, so you notice that when you break the bond, when you break the bond, uh, you notice that there are some bonds that is not being broken down. Right? For example, like here, the CH bonds are remain constant. It doesn't change at all. So it is not always breaking all the bond and then forming all the bond. You don't have to do it this way. So here, 
it doesn't break any CH bond, so we can keep those. What we are breaking is the CBR bond and the OH bonds. And if you're smart, you notice that here we have two OH bonds, and here we still have one OH bond. So actually, the OH bond here, only one of them is broken. Another one doesn't break. Okay? So this is the two bonds that we have broken. Okay? And here we will form a CO bond and the HBR bond. So these are the bond breaking and bond forming. So for bond broken, it is CBR bond and OH bond. And for bond that is formed, we have CO bond and we have the HBR bond. Okay? So that's the idea. Now on the next page, uh, these are some daily life example. Um, so in, in your test book, you have a couple of examples. So that's why I also want to introduce some daily life related examples, uh, but I put it in the form of a question. Okay. Um, here, instant cold pack, make use of the water pouch bag surrounded by ammonium nitrate solid, ammonium nitrate. Okay. When used, water, the water pouch bag is squeezed to burst and the pack begins to get cold. So the idea is inside this pack we have a small water pouch. So we have a water bag inside this pack. And this water bag is surrounded by this solid. So when you press it, the water pouch get burst, the water released it and come across with ammonium nitrate solid. And you will expect to see the ammonium nitrate solid will dissolve in the water. Okay, to form a solution. So here, write an equation for the change involved. So actually, it is simply NH4NO3 uh, as a solid becomes NH4NO3 aqueous. This is not even a chemical reaction. This is actually the change. It's a physical change. Okay. Now, is this process exothermic or endothermic? Explain briefly. This one must be endothermic. Okay. Because you are now using it as a cold pack. So you want to make the pack cold. How can you make the pack cold? Is to have an endothermic reaction that takes place which absorbs heat from the surrounding. Okay? So you can put down, since the reaction absorbs heat from surrounding and make the pack cold, right? So the key is absorb heat from the surrounding, okay? Now, so just one use of instant cold pack. So, of course, it is used to, okay, uh, reduce swelling, okay, of injured body part or burnt Okay, body part. Okay, or you can uh, for people who have uh, fever. Okay, so you can use it to uh, reduce the suffering as it having a fever, something like that. Now a hand warmer. So it's just like at the opposite of a cold pack, right? This time it is used to release heat, to make it warm. Um, how does it work? Actually, it contains iron powder, iron powder. So the iron powder contained in an air permeable bag that gives you a lot of hints, air permeable. Huh? And iron is oxidized to form iron-3 oxides. Again, write down a balanced chemical equation. So we have iron, we have oxygen in the air, of course, oxygen in the air to form Fe3O4. Okay, uh, Fe2O3, sorry. Fe2O3, solid. Okay? Now, of course, you need to balance the equation, so you will have 2, 3, 4. Okay? Uh, to use the hand warmer, it is advised to gently rub the back, suggest the purpose of rubbing the back. So I think you do have this experience before. Rubbing the back makes it warm faster. Okay? So the reason why is because uh, 2, 
increase okay the contact between iron powder and oxygen so to speed up the reaction and heat up faster okay to increase the contact between iron powder and oxygen so that the reaction is faster and therefore the, the, the pack heat up faster okay well when making the hand warmer the manufacturer must carefully consider the particle size of iron powder why is this so now this has to do with the safety of course uh, because if the reaction goes too fast then the pack gets hot very fast of course we may get burned by the pack also if the temperature is really high if there's a chance where the paper get burned or if this is plastic then it will get melt okay so that's the idea you will mention about um, first of all powder size you need to mention about okay um, the powder size okay you, you can mention about um, okay if powder size is too small reaction proceeds too fast the pack may get too hot and burn the customer okay so if powder size is too large okay reactions is too slow to warm up the pack so uh, something like this you can use your own words to explain the concept but I think you mentioned it with reference to the safety and also is uh, functionality okay and that would be perfect okay and then uh, for part C here for part C this one I'm pretty sure you have seen this one or you have uh, ate this one before which is the um, uh, self-heating hot pot um, you know how it works there are two compartments uh, the upper compartment containing the food that we eat but the lower compartment consists of a mixture of quicklime and other solid okay which is the heating pack the heating compartment okay we will add the water into the lower compartment to start off the heating uh, state the chemical reaction involved now this one you should have learned it in form 3 um, the reaction between quicklime and water if you add quicklime in water it will give you calcium hydroxide okay now uh, this one should be AQ because usually you add quite a lot of water inside okay describe the energy conversion so the energy conversion should be obvious from chemical energy to heat energy okay so that should do it hopefully that gives you more uh, daily life uh, examples of how uh, energy change in chemical reaction is important. So uh, that's it for this video.